I would have been out here a little bit sooner, but they gave me uh, the wrong dressing room, and I couldn't find any place to put my stuff. And I don't know how you are, but I need a place to put my stuff. So that's what I've been doing back there, just trying to find a place for my stuff. You know how important that is. That's the whole, that's the whole meaning of life, isn't it? Trying to find a place for your stuff. That's all your house is. Your house is just a place for your stuff. If you didn't need a house, you could just walk around all the time. That's all your house is. It's a pile of stuff with a cover on it. You see that when you take off in an airplane and you look down and you see everybody's got a little pile of stuff. Everybody's got their own pile of stuff. And when you leave your stuff, you gotta lock it up. Wouldn't want somebody to come by and take some of your stuff. They always take the good stuff. They don't bother with that crap you're saving. Ain't nobody interested in your fourth grade arithmetic papers. They're looking for the good stuff. That's all your house is. It's a place to keep your stuff while you go out and get more stuff. Now, sometimes, sometimes you've got to move. You've got to get a bigger house. Why? Too much stuff. You've got to move all your stuff. And maybe put some of your stuff in storage. Now imagine that. There's a whole industry based on keeping an eye on your stuff. <laughs> Enough about your stuff. Let's talk about other people's stuff. Did you ever notice when you go to somebody else's house, you never quite feel 100% at home? You know why? No room for your stuff. <laughs> somebody else's stuff is all over the place. And what awful stuff it is. Where did they get this stuff? How much stuff? We have. And how many of you have ever moved before? Yeah, you know, don't you? You know, we filled like, when we moved here, we threw uh, almost two dumpsters to, of stuff full away. Stuff we had carried with us for years, not knowing why. Yes, I'm one of those who kept, you know, uh, my, my good stuff. Yes? Hey, kids, you know what? It's time for your stuff to get out of here. All right, here we go. Guys, kids, you're dismissed. Thank you, McCarolina. <laughs> Sorry about that. All the kids, you're dismissed. Anyway, our stuff. We all got it. We all have stuff. We have stuff we don't need, stuff we use, stuff we don't use. You know, you know most guys have, you know, stuff full, of, a drawer full of T-shirts. You know, they don't know which ones to throw away, which one to give away, because they all got this emotional attachment to it. And some guys even have a strange attachments to certain kind of underwear. You know, it's just... You know, we, we like, for some reason, my wife says, well, you got to throw those away. They're just not usable anymore. I said, don't let me see. Just throw them away. We like our stuff, and we get emotionally attached to our stuff. And nobody better take our stuff. Like you said, they don't take, you know, when you get robbed, they never take, you know, the, the stuff you don't care about, you know. They take the stuff that you paid a lot of money for. And when we get attached, we get emotionally attached to our stuff. I believe we get spiritually, not in a good way, attached to our stuff. We don't want to let it go. It sounds like a song. Anyway, we don't want to let it go. We don't want to, we, we just get so tight-fisted to our stuff, to the things that we own, the money that we have, and, you know, just, well, just to prove it to you, according to the American Almanac, even though the United States has only 5% of the world's population, we have only 5% of the world's population that live in the great U.S. of A. We consume 26% of the world's energy. 26% of the world's energy is here. You know, we have to in order to run our air conditioners, our washers, dryers, TV, DVD players, computers, hot water heaters, microwaves, refrigerators, freezers, electric lights, stereos, cell phone chargers, answering machines, electric razors, hair dryers, curling iron, treadmills, you know, and soon, very soon, and it's coming, it's right around the corner, electric cars, you're going to have a place on your house to plug in your electric car. We consume 26% of the world's energy. Folks, that equates that we got a lot of stuff. So, you know, I reckon, have you ever wonder why the rest of the world hates the U.S.? You get a picture now? So our economic status separates us from the rest of the world. Because we use 20, 26% of the world's energy, we are leaving 74% of the world's energy to the remaining 95% of the world's population. Wow. 
This tells me we own a lot of stuff. And you think, well, that's unbelievers and believers alike, but unbelievers and believers alike, own, un, unbelievers and believers alike own a lot of stuff. Do you know what believers spend? I know it's already up there. We spend an hour, we spend an average of $4.5 billion a year on what I call Jesus junk. $4.5 million a year. God, give me 10% of that here. <laughs> Folks, we're just as guilty. Let's not call out the world here. These are believers. Christian bookstore is the thing to do. Because, boy, you can buy stuff in the name of who? Jesus. And that makes it what? Right. Well, whatever, whatever floats your boat. Four point, that was an astounding one. $4.5 million a year is on Jesus junk. And having stuff or buying, you know, this Jesus stuff, it's, it's not evil, folks. It's, it, it's not evil, nor do I believe it'll keep you out of heaven. It just opens up a whole bottleneck of questions. How much stuff do you need? How much, you know, how many Bibles do you need to own? Come on, church. Gee whiz, some of us got five, six, seven Bibles in our house. And we only use how many? Maybe two at the most, King James and whatever other translation there is. We got a lot of stuff. We like to accumulate and we like to hoard things. You ever watch the show Hoarders? Oh, my stars. I tell you, that's a sickening show to watch. It makes me throw up. And I, you know, why are we never content with what we have? Why do we get so emotionally attached to our stuff that we can't give it up? Why do we get, why do we get more stuff when we already have, as he says, a bunch of stuff? Why do we need more? Well, to me, the ultimate question is that out of last week, you know, we were talking about what's God's mission, what's God's dream, what's God's vision for me. You know, I think the ultimate question that needs to be asked, you know, is how much stuff do I need to accomplish the dream that God gave you last week? You know, I ask you to write down. If you were here last week, I ask you to write down. If you haven't, you know, if you're here this week, I'm asking you to write down. What is God's dream for you? And we, we love praying for other people, and we love praying for their healing, and we, lo you know, we love doing those things. But you know, my challenge to you is not only to keep doing that, but also to ask God, okay, what is your dream for me? What is your vision for me? What is it that you want me to accomplish? And then today, okay, what stuff do I need to accomplish it? And as you look through the scriptures, you know, You'll learn that owning and having stuff, folks, is not the problem. Job was the wealthiest man in the world at one point. He owned a lot of stuff, but he was devotion was to God. Abraham was a wealthy man. He had flocks of sheep, had herds of cattle. He had a lot of stuff and a really big family. And he's the father of our faith. He, his devotion was to God. Jacob had a multitude of sheep and cattle and camels, was very rich in his day. And he keeps the story going of God with us. His devotion was to God. David, a wealthy king, he was the apple of God's eye. His devotion was to God. You see, they were focused on their mission. And what God had called them their do, to do. Their mission was to keep the story, to keep the story about there being only one true God alive. That's what Abraham started. Their, their mission was to convince the rest of the world that there's only one God. Their mission was to influence their culture and those around them. Their mission was to keep God in the face of mankind. The folks, they just knew how to make money. But their, their mission was not their money. Their mission was, oh boy, keeping this story going and keeping this story alive. Because we all know from last week that we're a part of a much bigger story than our own. And we learned last week that, boy, if you don't keep telling the story, the story dies with you. But they all were wealthy, but God, they, they were devoted to God. They put their trust in him more than their fortunes and possessions. They listened for God. They looked for God. They longed for God. And folks, to me, that's the difference between owning stuff and your stuff owning you. You can't serve your stuff and God. It's physically and spiritually impossible. Well, pastor, I know that. 
You do it. How come so few of those who say well, Christ followers have the trouble, have trouble carrying this out the most? Come on now, church. It's not, not what we struggle the most. Yeah, we do. But they listened for God and they looked for God and they longed for God. And this parable we're going to look at today points out, you know, points the greatest obstacle in accomplishing the dream God, you know, gave us last week or gave you last week. You know, remember, you know, God's dream has nothing to do with personal happiness. You know that, right? He doesn't care whether we're happy or not. God's dreams has nothing to do with personal success. God's dreams have nothing to do with personal fulfillment, but every, have every, you know, has every, uh, Everything to do with, you know, fulfilling the Great Commission. Folks, we've got to get that thought out of our head. Because we, we do think, you know, you know, those who have a lot of money are obviously blessed by who? God. There's just some people who know how to make money. I'm not one of those. <laughs> you know? There's just some people who know how to do it. I have a friend who's a millionaire many times over. He just knows how to make money. And you wouldn't know him if he sat here. You know? But our dreams have nothing, God's dream for us has nothing to do with personal happiness, personal success, or personal fulfillment. God's dream for us is taking all the resources we have available to us, investing them in the life of others. So why do we need to invest in the life of others? Because we want others to experience the love of God, right? Am I right? You know, we are Christ followers. We have experienced the love of God. And so for we want them to experience the love of God as well. And sometimes, as I have challenged you, you know, for the last few months, boy, to invest in one person and to bless them tangibly. So they can experience the love of God. Not so you can feel good about yourself, that you've accomplished something, but it, boy, it's really to show them uh, the picture that God really loves them. But God, you know, we, uh, the love of God is the only thing, and we know this. The love of God is the only thing that can change the heart of a man. Am I right? I'm sorry, great music, but that doesn't change the heart of man. You know? When a person experiences the love of God, that changes their heart. And one of the ways that people experience that love of God is through the love of another human being. Now, listen to this parable. This parable tells about the main culprit that keeps us from accomplishing his dream through us. And it comes from Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. It reads this way. Then someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, Friend, who made, me, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm and produced fine crops. He said to themselves, What should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and all the other goods. In other words, to store all my what? Stuff. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you've worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the music we've heard that has touched our heart. Thank you for your spirit who has stirred our heart. Now may your spirit open our ears and minds to what you have for us. Well, what I learned from this, greed keeps us. That's the culprit. Greed is the culprit that keeps us from accomplishing his dream through us. The Roger, uh, the Roper organization asked Americans who make fifteen to $30,000 how much they would need to fulfill all their dreams. The largest group said they need fifty to 60000 
Yet when the same question was asked, put to people earning over 50,000, the largest group in that segment said they need at least $125,000 a year, if not more. Isn't that us? I mean, don't we fit into those percentages somewhere? We always seem to need more. We need more time. We need more money. We need more of this, and we need more of that. And then I've heard a lot of Christ followers said, and I've been at their hospital side, bed at the hospital, and you know, I've heard a lot. I've heard them say this more than once. If I could only win the lottery, I would give ten percent. You know what I wanted to say? If you're not giving ten percent now, you're never going to give ten percent ever. I never said that. That wouldn't be a good pastoral visit, would it? <laughs> you know, if only I had more time, then I would be able to invest it in others. I can't believe we buy that lie. And we do. Oh, man, I wish I had 26 hours in a day to do what I need to do. You ever said that? If only I had more time. If only my schedule allowed me to participate, I'd show up and volunteer. Most of us will find time for the football game today, won't we? Sorry, that hurts, doesn't it? If only my schedule would allow me to. Well, Pastor, you don't know my schedule. I don't want to know your schedule. It's not about your schedule. It's about, boy, am I willing to invest myself in other people? That's the issue. Not your schedule. If I'm willing to invest myself in another person, what am I going to do? I'm going to what? I'm going to create the time, am I not? If I'm willing. And the scripture tells us, you know, all through the scriptures, you know, at least the scriptures I read, God doesn't need our time, and folks, God doesn't need our money, or he doesn't need, he doesn't need this, and he doesn't need that, and he doesn't even need our stuff. And mo most of us in here would say, Pastor, you're off your rocker. You're absolutely right. I'm off my rocker. Because what he needs is what? What's he need, folks? Your heart! He needs this! Because when he gets this, stuff doesn't matter. This doesn't matter anymore. In fact, I'm two years, five, ten years behind times. Because when he has your heart, he has it all. Am I right, church? So that tells me. That tells me. That he doesn't really want our time. He doesn't really want our money. He doesn't really want our stuff. He doesn't need that. He needs your heart. Am I right, church? Nod your head. Fall asleep. Do something. Because if he doesn't have your heart, if he doesn't have your heart, he's not going to get all that other stuff anyway. He knows that. He's a pretty smart God. And he'll let you pursue your stuff. He'll let you build your bigger houses. He'll let you accumulate your stuff. He'll let you do that. That's what's so amazing about God. And when you accumulate all this stuff, and then when you move, you're like, oh, really? And you have to throw half of it away. But what he really needs is your heart. And folks, get this, not more of your heart. I get tired of that religious game. Oh, I am gave Jesus more of my heart. No, he wants your heart, period. Not more of your heart. If you are a Christ follower, what did you give him when, you're, when, you, when you made that, that prayer of commitment? What did you give him? Thank you. You gave him all of your heart. Did you not? Or was that prayer a fake prayer? 
And that's what he wants. And that's where he wants to work. And that's what he wants to do. And he doesn't just want more of your hearts. I, I get tired of that religious talk. He just wants your heart. Not more of it, not less of it. He wants your heart, period. And he wants you to allow him, which I think is very gracious of God, he wants you to allow him to work in his heart. To work in your heart, I mean. Yeah. You got the picture, right? Because when you have your heart, folks, the rest of your stuff follows. According to the scripture. Listen to this story. Uh, about Gladys Holm. Uh, She never married. She lived alone and worked as a secretary her whole life for a medical supply company. And for 41 years, she worked as a secretary and never earning more than $15,000 a year. She lived in a two-bedroom townhouse. She became known as the teddy bear lady. Maybe you've seen that. She started this whole thing with teddy bears. If you, some hospitals do this. Uh, She became known as the teddy bear lady because she she sort of adopted children at the Memorial Hospital in Chicago, Illinois, after they, after they saved the life of a little girl named Adrian. Gladys knew Adrian's parents for years and was a friend of the family. And when Adrian was born, she was blue-faced, born with a block aorta, an enlarged heart with a hole in it. And, and, and most doctors thought it was, she was too young for surgery, but a physician at Children Memorial saved her life. So Gladys was in donations now and then, always adding, there'll be more later. Gladys would bring teddy bears for the kids who were sick, sometimes bringing dozens of teddy bears. Her house was always, her always had teddy bears laying around. She died recently at the age of 86, and only about 30 people attended her funeral. Yet she left money for them to eat at a fast, fancy restaurant across the street with one stipulation. Talk about the good time. The most amazing thing was, when she died, she left $18 million dollars. She left 18, the lady made $15,000 a year. She gave $18 million to the, to the hospital. How she did that, whenever boss bought some stock of medical supply company, bought stock in that, she'd buy some for herself. You know, and she threw some luxurious parties and she bought expensive jewelry, but she gave to help others. And she would often use the teddy bears as a way to get close to the families. And when she would learn that the the illness was putting a heavy strain on on their family finances, you know what she would do? (laughs) Sucker. No, what do you think she did? She paid their bills. And they never knew. She lived on less so others could benefit. She didn't ask that her name be put on a new hospital wing so everyone would know how generous she was. She didn't even show everyone how much money she had so that people would be impressed. She simply gave her life to help others. Do you think she was listening to the voice of God? God has her heart. You see, the only thing that matters to God is not how much money you and I make. It's not how much, really how much we give. But it does say you're a fool if you store up earthly wealth, according to the scripture. Folks, what matters to him and what matters in this parable was his heart. And folks, what he needs is your heart. And what I've learned, the more stuff you have, the harder it is to build that rich relationship with God that he calls for because some, so sometimes your stuff demands your attention as well. And, and what, puts our, what puts our stuff, what puts your stuff in perspective, folks, is a rich relationship with God. It really does. You know, think about it this way. If, you would, if Dana just had 80% of my heart and I gave Sally 10% and Harriet 10%, I'd make a TV show, number one, you know? You know, there already is a TV show like that. Again, that's one that makes me nauseated. You know? Just how rich would Dan and I's relationship be? 
wouldn't be rich at all because she didn't have my heart. What matters to God and God's dream for each one of us is to have a rich relationship with him. And when you have a rich relationship with him, he will give you a new heart. This is based from Ezekiel 36, 26. When you have a relationship with him, he will give you a new heart. He will put a new spirit in you. He will turn your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. Isn't that awesome? Out of a relationship with God. He will take your stony, stubborn, selfish, self-centered heart. And he will soften it. And he will replace it with a tender, responsive heart. You see, when you have a rich relationship with him, he gives you a generous heart. When you have a rich relationship with him, investing in others is your top priority. When you have a rich relationship with him, you trust that he'll provide everything you need. That's really all there is to it, folks. When you, have, when you have that rich relationship with him, your heart is already, it becomes generous. And, and you make others your top priority. And you trust that he'll provide everything you need, even though you just gave some of it away. We're so afraid to give and sit away because we're afraid what they're going to misuse it. They're not going to use it for the right thing. But when you have a rich relationship with him, that doesn't make a difference. You see, greed keeps us from having a rich relationship with God. And greed, greed folks, is not about having a lot of money. It's not. Greed is that ongoing belief that I, I, I can only get it, I, I, I can't get enough money. If only we could get that one thing, I can feel safe and secure. If only if I just, you know, boy, if only if I just made ten more thousand dollars, then I would, then I'd be what? I'd be happy. Am I right? Folks, if you aren't happy now, you're not gonna be happy then. Because when you get to fifty thousand dollars, what do you want to want? Man, if only I had $125,000, I could really be happy. And when you get to one hundred twenty, dollars which I'll never see in my life, when you get to $125,000, you say, oh, man, if only I had a half a million. Then we reach that. And we a half, man, if only I had $5 million, then I'd be happy. Oh, Lord, just give it to me, please. You know I'm a good steward. And some people are good at making money, like I said. But God said, hey, are you first devoted to God and to seeking him and longing for him and allowing him to determine your priorities? Well, it's my money. Yeah. It's my stuff. Okay. He doesn't want that. What's he want? Your heart. But greed keeps us from that. Greed is that longing in our heart for more stuff. And greed is never being content with what you have. And greed steals that dream God has for us. Because, and because of our longing for more stuff, we, we never notice the needs around us. Or if we, if we do notice, we don't, we don't have the resources to meet the need. No, except for the kingdom of God, folks. Jesus spent more time talking about our stuff and what to do with it than any other subject, more than heaven and hell. Look it up. 280 some odd scriptures referring to our stuff and what to do with it. Only the kingdom of God exceeds that. So what do you think God's priority is according to his word if you live according to his word? Now, if you don't live according to his word, you're exempt. Okay? But if you're living according to his word, we're not exempt from that. And I found this thing. Uh, some guy wrote it. didn't have any who wrote it. But he said this. And I was like, wow. A person's attitude towards their money or possessions in relation to giving 
for support of ministries, the poor, etc., is a very accurate physical uh, barometer on the reality of a person's faith and trust in God. That saying, you know, that saying that says, put your money where your mouth is, completely relates to matters of faith. If you're going to be stingy and hoarding of this form of power and control in your life, money, how can you honestly say that God can really do anything with you in this life? Because to do that, he requires total submission to his will. What's it say in a nutshell? If you can't give at least 10, if you can't give 10% of your income to the church, if you can't give your money to the poor, you've got a greed problem. That's one of the seven deadly sins, which means that is something that can destroy you. And what we do with our resources, folks, I didn't write it. But what, do we, what we do with our resources is a direct reflection of whether God has your heart. That's why I spent a lot of time talking about it. Folks, we have an emotional connection to this, don't we? We have an emotional connection. I got two. It shows you how important I am. We have an emotional connection to this, don't we? And to this. Well, let me find it. We do. So my question for you this morning, not does God have your heart, not does how much, how much stuff you have or, you know, what you need to do with your stuff. It's evil. It's not evil to have stuff. Don't let everybody tell you that. It's not evil to have a lot of money. Don't let anybody tell you that. But does God have your heart? And you honestly have to look at that. And I told you, folks, we're part of that 26%, you know, that uses all this energy around the world. So none of us are exempt from this this morning. You contributed to it. You have a cell phone, you're contributing to it. You have an electric car, you're contributing to it. You have a microwave, you own a house, you own stuff. <laughs> you're contributing to it. So none of us are